Last year, a raging blizzard struck the northern coast of Labrador. Many hunters were caught in the country. It was a terrible time. Somehow, most of them made it back to the coast. But there were three, Gus Bennett, Paulus Simiuk, and Martin Sillett, who froze to death. Martin was well known to us at Land and Sea, for we'd gone caribou hunting with him less than a year before. He helped us make this film about caribou hunting in the north and what it means to our native people. We've postponed showing it till now because of the tragedy and dedicate it to the memory of Gus Bennett, Paula Simiak, and our friend and companion, Martin Sillett. <laughs> Nain, the northernmost community on the coast of Labrador. It is late winter. The frosty air is filled with the sounds of snowmobiles as people go about their business, visiting with the kids, going to the store, returning from the country. The ground and the sea are still frozen solid, but at midday, there's a touch of spring in the air. Inland, though, in the high mountains where the caribou live, it's still the dead of winter. Spring comes late to this country. The people of Nain are mostly Inuit, but there are settler families here too. They all live by hunting and fishing. There are no salmon or char this time of year, but there are rock cod you can jig out in the bay. Now a meal of fresh cod is all right, but at this time of year it's caribou, not cod that most people are interested in. Many have already returned from the country. No longer do men hunt by dog team. Those days are over. But the old traditions continue. Young men continue to hunt for those who are no longer able to travel to the caribou country. The meat is shared by all. The caribou is important to those who live in the north. The caribou has been uh, the big game since I can remember from way back, I guess it goes back way back to the first Inuit people ever come on in Labrador. And it's a tradition to, to have the caribou. And this, people rely on the caribou for food, Due to the fact that you, you, your, your food in the stores is not all that great, you have some supplies coming in the fall of the year, and by this time of the year in the spring, it's getting pretty musky, so you know, the caribou is very important to the people in the northern Labrador coast. It's not all that easy. You know, someone might think sometimes you just go in there and pick them up, but sometimes you can have a, a, a very tough time in the country. It's a very wild country in there when you get in there. Back in 1972, I was in the country, went in through Davis Inlet, myself and just Flowers and another guy from Makovic. We were stuck in there for 29 days. We was in this windstorm, and you just couldn't move out the, out the snow house. You know, we were just stuck there. We just had to take the consequences, and regardless of what happened, we couldn't move. Well, we'd come to Nain to see for ourselves, to find out what it was like in the northern Labrador wilderness to find out what the caribou really means to the people who live here. And the hunters of Nain were glad to oblige. The next day we were whipping along over the sea ice at a fast clip. We were on our way to the caribou country. Hour after hour we traveled north over the frozen ocean. 
The coast here is frozen out to the horizon, at least 50 miles or so of thick salt water ice stretching eastward as far as the eye could see. And so we traveled across the frozen Labrador Sea. We were working our way north to a river valley that leads back through the mountains to the caribou country. This route is known to the Inuit as Tequetecoc. Well, finally the trip over the sea ice was over. We were approaching the river, the long valley which leads into the caribou country. The first leg of the journey was over. We could see the hills now, towering out of the coastal plain and on either side of the river. It was time for a cup of tea. And time to check the comatics. I noticed that we were carrying caribou skins into the country. Seems strange but I was soon to learn of their importance. The hunters, well, there was Bill Edmonds. I'd known Bill for a long time. Abel Leo was an old friend too. I'd boarded at his house. Here's Martin, Martin Sillis and the leader of the hunting party, Apa Hoyok. Here we were, four hunters, four men of the north, and three green outsiders with cameras and tape recorders, sharing a cup of tea and gradually getting to know each other in the Labrador wilderness. Then it was time to gather everything together for the second leg of the trip. We still had a long way to go. Each comatic carried five or six spare tanks of gas, about 30 gallons for each machine. We'd need it. And away we go again. We were headed up the river now, the beginning of a long meandering course that would lead us through the hills and eventually to the high country where the caribou would be. Along the river mouth, there were stretches of open water along one shore, kept open by the current. And at one place, there was a field of stones and boulders, swept bare in places by the wind. I was told that it's hard going here sometimes. We could see the mountains clearly now. It was beautiful country. On and on we went, sometimes taking shortcuts, one side of the river, then another, wherever the going seemed best. So all day we worked our way up the river, stopping every few hours to boil the kettle and coming to a halt every time someone spotted a partridge in the trees along the riverbank. How they could see them, I don't know. I kept straining my eyes but didn't spot a bird. Yet the boys could drop them with a 22. They look the same as our Newfoundland partridge in wintertime. The willow partridge here in the valleys are called brookers, 
and the rock partridge higher up called baroners. Away we went again up the valley, working our way inland to the caribou country. I'd heard of a place called Devil's Hole before, so I was ready for anything. It turned out to be a narrow pass through the hills, where the snowmobiles and cometics must inch their way along an icy ledge. You can't see it now, but swirling savagely just under the ice below the ledge is fast water and a treacherous whirlpool. Sometimes it's open. It's a dangerous spot. But we made it through Devil's Hole without too much trouble. Not long after Devil's Hole, the sun dipped behind the hills. It was time to pitch the tent and crawl in for the night. Here I would understand why we carried caribou skins into the country. The next day the weather wasn't as good. The sky was overcast. There was a touch of snow on the wind. We pushed on up the river. Hour after hour passed. I began to realize what distance means in the north. Back home, it's a big deal to go a few miles by snow toboggan. Here, trips are measured in hundreds of miles. These machines are not toys in this part of the country. Already, one machine had broken down. We'd left it by the side of the river, along with a cometic and part of our supplies. Finally, we reached the place where we leave the river valley and make for the high plateau. Since our machines were overloaded now with extra bodies, some of us got off to walk up. It was a real thrill to finally be there, on the top of this high plateau, the roof of northern Labrador. A series of rolling hills stretching to Ongava Bay, sky and swirling snow blending together. This is the caribou country. It wasn't long before we came across a snow house. It was the first I'd ever seen. Perhaps tonight we'd build one for ourselves. Then Apple spotted a pair of wolves. He quickly unhitched his cometic and took off by himself. He disappeared into the blinding whiteness. We waited and waited. And finally, the black dot in the distant snow grew larger and larger. It was Appa returning. And sure enough, he had the wolf. Wolves follow the caribou herds, killing the weak and the old animals. With wolves around, there was a good chance the caribou were near. Wolves are worth a lot of money to a hunter. Appa figured he'd get $200 for this one. The fur is about the warmest you can get. It's the best there is for fringing Parker hoods. He'd skin it later, after we get our caribou. On we went from one hill to another, scanning the countryside, looking for the herd.
finally, there they were. With their white winter coats, they were really hard to see against the snow. The hunters planned what they'd do. We watched and filmed as best we could without spooking the herd. They edged closer and closer. There were caribou everywhere. Some herds were restless, others quiet. This isn't a trophy hunt. Meat is what's needed. The hunters take their time, choosing their animals. Then, and then it was all over. The caribou lay dead in the snow. Now begins a new kind of work, ponching, getting the meat ready for the long trip home. Fourteen caribou, that's what they were after, that's what they killed. It's about all that could be loaded on the comatics. One animal was still alive. Martin finished him off quickly. Punching must be done right away, for the animals will freeze quickly in this weather. And since you have to work with bare hands, it's best to do it while the animal is still warm. The parts that are no good are left for the foxes and the ravens. Everyone works quickly, efficiently. The caribou carcasses are bundled up and placed on the comatics. This is quite a skill in itself. I wondered how in the world all these animals would fit on. But then I'd realized they'd all done this hundreds of times before and knew just how to stack the carcasses and lash them on. Soon they'd be frozen solid. For most of the trip, I was too numb to help out with the ropes. Appa and Abel made it look like child's play. It was getting windy now. The snow was starting to drift. The hunt was over. We had our caribou. It was time to head back. Already the wind was picking up here on the barrens, beginning to cover the remains of our caribou. Storms pick up fast here on the high ground. I was hoping we'd spend at least one night in here in a snow house, but Appa said no. The snow was not good, and he didn't like the look of the sky. Remembering Bill Edmonds' story of being stuck here for 29 days, I didn't put up much of an argument. So back we came, from the high caribou country, down to the valley again.
hour after hour passed as we picked our way down the river. Two other hunters from Hopedale joined us for the return trip. We camped together that night, not far from where we pitched our tent on the way up. Our little green tent wouldn't be as crowded tonight, for some of us would bunk with the Hopedale hunters. Now we were really getting hungry, and everything we had was frozen cold junk. Tea is okay to warm you up, but it doesn't really give your stomach much to work on. We were all a bit tired of biscuits by now, and frozen sardines didn't appeal to anyone either. Yet, here we were, surrounded by hundreds of pounds of fresh, frozen caribou meat. Martin figured it was time to revive an old custom. And I was just hungry enough to try it too. Not bad, a little rare, but not bad at all. Darkness came. We slept well. Next day, we pushed on down the valley. Every now and then, there'd be a pause while someone went after a partridge. Like the caribou, they were hard to spot against the snow. But Appa and Martin had no trouble knocking them over with their 22s. By now, I was beginning to realize that caribou is not the only game in this country. Partridge is an important food, too. There were lots of them along the river valley, and they were easy to get. They were starting to add up. A bundle of white feathers now dangled from each comatic. A good many meals for later on. We continued on down the river valley. I noticed how quickly conditions can change. Places that were glassy ice on the way up were now choked with snow. Soft spots in the river were now hard. Hard spots were soft. But we still had to go through Devil's Hole. What would it be like? Slippery, that's what it was like. So slippery that ropes had to be used. But we made it through Devil's Hole again, with no real trouble. Easy going from now on, I thought, and it was for a while, till we reached the mouth of the river. Here the wind was picking up. It was blustery out on the sea ice. The hunters talked about whether we should camp or push on. Would it get better or worse? We'd try it. Nain was only a few hours away.
It was well into the evening when we arrived. Next day, cleaned up and whiskers gone, I wandered about Nain. Our trip was over. Life was back to normal. Bill, Appa, Martin and Abel had work to do. The caribou had to be skinned and cleaned and stowed away. As is the custom, much of the meat was given away to the old people. I watched but didn't see. For in my mind, I was still racing along on the snowmobile, headed into the caribou country, into the wild, beautiful land back of Nain. Yes, wild and beautiful and bountiful, but fierce and cruel too. For later, it would snuff out the lives of Martin and two other hunters. But men continue to go back to the country. And I suppose they always will, for it beckons. It stirs the blood, and man must have meat. Hunting is part of life here in northern Labrador.